أعطنا بما علمتنا وفقنا للعمل فيما يرضيك عنا بجاه نبيك الأكرم صلى الله عليه وسلم وبسر القرآن العظيم وبسر سورة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن صراط الذين Thereafter, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who revealed the Qur'an al-Kareem to his special servant, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah azza wa jal to send his peace and blessings upon our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his blessed family, his loyal companions, and all of those who followed after them with excellence up until the day of standing. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a great portion from the meanings and the secrets of the Qur'an al-Kareem that were revealed to the blessed heart of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Thereafter, inshallah, we will try to study um, Surah Al-Kahf, um, which wasn't on the list, but uh, it's been chosen. So we'll try to study Surah Al-Kahf for this week. And to do so, we'll have to get through uh, quite a portion today uh, and likewise uh, in the coming days. So inshallah, we'll go straight into it. Surah Al-Kahf is a surah that was revealed in Makkah Al-Mukarramah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke about this blessed surah and he said, anybody who re recites Surah Al-Kahf on Friday, anybody who recites Surah Al-Kahf on Friday will have a nur, a light that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala places with that person from that Friday till the Friday that to come. For an entire week, this, this surah will illuminate that person and they will have a light with them from one Friday to the, uh, to the other by reciting Surah Al-Kahf. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that anybody who memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf and in one narration, the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. So we have two narrations. One is for the first 10 verses and one is for the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. Anybody who memorizes these 10 verses the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, they will be protection for that person against the Dajjal. They will be protection for that person against the Dajjal. And anybody who sees the Dajjal, then he should start to recite these verses of Surah Al-Kahf. So we see how important this Surah is for all of us, especially living at the end of times. And without a doubt, uh, the way the climate of the world is going, it doesn't seem like there's too long left. Huh. I'm not setting a date, by the way. right? Uh, but the way things are going, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and we ask for his protection and we should try our utmost best to memorize at least the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf so that if we end up in that, that time, Allah give us tawfiq that we can also recite those verses. Naam. So, uh, Surah Al-Kahf begins with Alhamdulillah. It begins with Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The surah before it is Surah Al-Isra or Surah Bani Israel, which starts with Subhan al -Ladhi, right? And so Subhan al means glorified and exalted is the one who took his special servant on the night journey, right? So, and the word Subhan is used, the Arabs use this word Subhan or Subhanallah when they are amazed at something, when they are amazed at something. So the journey of Isra and Mi'raj was an amazing journey. So Allah said Subhan al right? Whereas the Qur'an al karim uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it and he said Alhamdulillah alladhi Praise be to the one who revealed this book upon his special servant Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Now the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf has a connection with the beginning of Surah Al-Isra but it also has a connection with the end of Surah Al-Isra What's the last verse of Surah Al-Isra, the surah that comes right before it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِيٌ مِّنَ الزُّلِّ وَكَبِّرْهُ تَكْبِيرًا In the last verse of Surah Al-Isra, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقُلْ and say, الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ Praise be to Allah, الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدًا The one who did not take a son. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ And the one who does not have a partner in his kingdom. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِيٌّ مِّنَ الزُّلْ And the one that does not have an assister or a helper. And uh, an assister and a helper. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who does not have an assister or a helper. مِّنَ uh, الزُّلْ Out of need. 
right? Why do people need somebody to assist them and help them when they are in need? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of anybody or anything, so he doesn't need an assister. وَكَبِّرْهُ تَكْبِيرًا And Allah said, and magnify him a magnification and say, Allahu Akbar, right? So the last verse of Surah Al-Isra ends with, instructing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say Alhamdulillah. And the first verse of the next surah, which is Surah Al-Kahf, begins with Alhamdulillah. And Imam Ibn Ajib radiallahu an, he said, he said the connection between these two verses, the connection between the end of Surah Al-Isra and the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf is such that when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala instructed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the end of Surah Al-Isra uh, to praise Allah the one who did not have a partner and the one who did not take a son and the one who does not need a helper. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the Prophet sallallahu to praise him upon his transcendent nature, nature and his exalted being and glorified being subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began this surah by saying, Alhamdulillah, now praise Allah for another blessing. Now this blessing is a blessing that's upon you and that's the blessing of the revelation of the Quran al kareem the, first, the last blessing that Allah spoke about in Surah Al-Isra was the blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal being glorified and transcendent and being clear of having a partner, having a son, having a, a helper. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directed the attention of the Prophet to another blessing which was the revelation of the Quran al kareem and Allah said Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. Praise be to the one who revealed upon his special servant ala abdihi al-kitab, the book, wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. And that this book did not have any crookedness to it. No iwaj. Iwaj is to have crookedness. Allah said this book doesn't have crookedness. In this verse, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Prophet sallallahu as Abd, his special servant. And the scholars have said, the highest and the greatest rank that any human being can ever reach before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that of servitude. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was the most special servant of Allah who reached the pinnacle of that servitude sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then Allah said, this book, then Allah described it and said, Qayyiman, it's an upright book. First Allah said that it doesn't have crookedness and then for further clarification Allah said Qayyiman, it is an upright book. And why did Allah send this book? Then he explains, he says لِيُنذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا مِنْ لَدُنْهِ So that he can warn against a severe punishment that comes from him. Now when somebody warns, there must be somebody who is being warned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't mention who he is warning. He only said, لِيُنذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدًا So that he warns against a severe punishment that comes from him. But he didn't speak, speak about who is being warned. And the scholars have said here, uh, uh, those who are being warned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala omitted them and left them out so that this warning can be general for all types of people. Huh? So it can be general for all types of people. Uh, this is one. Uh, opinion and the other is that this warning was for those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disbelieve in his commandments and disbelieve in uh, in the afterlife and then Allah said mentioned another reason why he revealed the Quran and he said الصالحات, and to give glad tidings the Quran was revealed to warn and to give glad tidings to the believing people and who are the believing people those who do good actions those who do good actions. Now here the scholars have said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to give the believing people, the people of Iman, glad tidings. And then he said who these people are and said, they are the ones who do good, good actions action. to indicate that good actions without Iman are useless. If somebody has lots of actions which are good, but doesn't have Iman uh, behind that to back that, then those actions will be useless in the afterlife. They might have some type of reward in this world, but in the afterlife, they won't have any reward whatsoever. Is that clear? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and then give, um, to give glad tidings to the believing people who do good actions. What, what's the glad tidings? Allah said, Anna lahum ajran hasana. To give them glad tidings that they have a beautiful hasan reward. That they have a beautiful Hassan reward. And then Allah said, 
makisina fihi abada it's such a reward that they will forever dwell within it they will forever dwell in this uh, beautiful reward then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, returns back to speaking about the warning of the quran al kareem and he said wa yunzir alladhina qalu ittakhadha allah walada first allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remember in that verse he mentioned that the quran was revealed to warn people against the severe punishment but remember what we said that allah did not mention who was being warned and the reason for omitting this was to keep the warning general for all people now in this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is specifying his warning and he's saying وَيُنذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا and to warn those who said اتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ وَلَدًا that allah took a son allah took a child now imam al-nakhai radiyallahu anhu said he said when you pass by verses like this in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is relating what those people said, you should lower your voice in recital. You should lower your voice in recital out of adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huh? So the scholars would recite like this. Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja qayyiman liyunzira ba'san shadeedan min ladunhu wa yubashira al-mu'minin al-lazina ya'amaloon al-salihat anna lahum anna lahum ajran hasana makithina fihi abada wa yunzira al-lazina qalu attakhadha allahu walada to recite these verses with a low voice in which Allah relates about those people who associated and affiliated sons or some type of partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of adab with Allah azza wa jal. Then Allah said, and to warn those who associated a child, a son to Allah. And then Allah said, مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ They have no knowledge regarding this. They have no knowledge. I.e. they are working, uh, work, working upon assumptions. They don't have any knowledge. Walali abaihim, and nor did their forefathers have any knowledge, i.e., those who associated with God, uh, and they used to say, Wajadna aliha abaana. This is what we found our fathers, forefathers doing, worshipping these idols, associating with God. Allah said, Ma lahum bihi min ilm. They have no knowledge. Walali abaihim, and their forefathers had no knowledge concerning it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kaburat kalimatan. This is a big word that's come out of their mouths. Uh, they've made a big statement, right? To say such a thing, and when we say it's a big statement, i.e. it's an awfully bad and a big statement that they've made. Uh, like for example, if, if a child makes a cheeky statement before his or her parents, the parents say that's something, you, a little boy has said something big. Uh, Allah is the greatest of examples. Allah is saying to them, Kalimatan, uh, Allah said, Kaburat Kalimatan Takhruju min Afwahihim. It's a big statement that they've made with their mouths. In Yaquluna illa Kaziba. Allah said they don't say anything except lies. They don't say anything except for lies. Now, in these verses that we have recited, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the servitude of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the scholars have said, مَنْ كَمُلَتْ عُبُودِيَّتُهُ لِلَّهِ Anybody whose servitude becomes perfect towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. it works towards perfection. Anybody whose servitude works towards, anybody who works in their servitude to, create, to, to work towards, progress towards perfection in it and becomes a free person, i.e. free from whim, whim, free from desire, free from the ego, free from having any, um, uh, any type of, um, uh, free from having, uh, being affected by any type of impact in one's life, becomes totally free 
uh, doesn't become a slave to his whims, no to his ego, no to other people, no to society, no to uh, the, the, the trends that are uh, uh, go, uh, prevailing, no to time, no to people, uh, no, no to the people of the dunya. Doesn't be a slave to them, but rather be a free person. And his slaveship is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the scholars have said, such a person who works towards this perfection, will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends messages to his or her heart of comfort and beauty and peace. Like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his, his ubudiyah, his servitude was perfect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so hence Allah revealed the Qur'an to his heart. Likewise, from the believing people who work to create uh, uh, perf perfection within their servitude, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then starts sending messages to their hearts of comfort and tranquility and peace. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, so the last verse that we spoke about was when Allah said, وَيُنذِرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا And this Qur'an was revealed to warn those who said that Allah has a son. And Allah said, مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ They have no knowledge, nor did their forefathers have knowledge. Now when the Prophet ﷺ was propagating the Qur'an and teaching people the Qur'an and speaking about revelation, there were those who accepted and there were those who denied and rejected. Those who denied and rejected. When the Prophet ﷺ used to come about these people, his heart used to feel really sorry for them. The Prophet ﷺ used to feel really sorry for them and he used to become very upset that he is reciting the words of Allah, he is reciting the Qur'an to them, and these people are rejecting, these people are denying, these people are not accepting. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw the Prophet in such a state of being upset and being uncomfortable because these people were not accepting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِن لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفًا It's as if you are troubling yourself it's as if you are troubling yourself because of these people who are not accepting who are not, not accepting this revelation that we are sending to you. The Prophet used to become extremely upset. He used to become very uncomfortable that he is reciting the words of Allah. He is the messenger of Allah to them and they are not accepting. Allah said to the Prophet it seems like you are becoming upset and uncomfortable and uh, um, uh, because of them not accepting this revelation that's coming to you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu This next verse, which means, Indeed, we have created upon the earth zinatan uh, laha. It's de decoration for the earth. We have placed upon the earth its decoration. So uh, the waters, the trees, the greenery, all of this decorates the earth. All of this decorates the earth. Allah said, we have decorated the earth. Why did we do this? لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ So that we may test them, i.e. mankind. أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Which of them is the best in actions? Now the scholars have said, what's the connection between the, these two verses? Allah said to the Prophet ﷺ, it seems like you're becoming upset because these people are not, not accepting uh, revelation and not accepting you. In the next verse, Allah said, and we have decorated the earth with its decorations so that we can test people so that, uh, which, to see which of them is the best of them in action. The scholars have said this verse is the reasoning for why they did not accept. This verse is the reasoning for why they did not accept. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet sallallahu don't become upset over them and don't become worried because of them. Because the reason that they are not accepting revelation and not accepting you and the Qur'an is because they're too preoccupied with the affairs of the dunya. Dunya has overcome their hearts so much that they don't have space in their hearts for revelation. They don't have space in their hearts to, to hear the Qur'an and to sense the beauty of the Qur'an because the, their hearts have become overcome by the dunya. And the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الدُّنْيَا حُلْوَةٌ خَضِرَةٌ Indeed, this dunya, this world, it's hulwa, it's very sweet. Khadira, it's nice and bright and green. It's very green and it's very sweet. And then he said, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مُسْتَخْلِفُكُمْ فِيهِ 
and Allah has placed you in this earth. فَيَنظُرُ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ and he's going to see how you behave and how you act upon this earth which has been made very sweet and very attractive and very green, i.e. it's attractive to the eye and attractive to the heart. Those who get caught up in the attractions of the, of the dunya, then their hearts have no space for revelation in the Qur'an. It's as if Allah is saying to the Prophet ﷺ, don't become upset about them. Because the reason why they're not accepting the Qur'an is because their hearts are preoccupied with the dunya. And the Prophet ﷺ, when diagnosing the illness of this ummah, he said, حُبُّ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَاهِيَةُ الْمَوْتِ He said that the illness of this ummah, i.e. the Muslims, is love of this dunya and hate of death, disliking death, right? Uh, that people will become priya. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I don't fear that you become mushrik after me. I don't fear that you will become people who associate with God partners. No. But I fear dunya. I fear that you will become occupied with the dunya such that it will destroy you the way it destroyed the people before you. And one of the ways that it destroyed the people before us is that when the dunya came into their hearts, space for revelation didn't exist in their hearts. So then they began to deny uh, Allah said, which of them is the best in action? Now, the scholars interpreted this to say that to test them to see, after seeing all of this glamour and all of this beauty and all of this sweetness and all of this greenery of the dunya, which of them will be abstinent from it? And how, uh, uh, how high their levels of abstinence will be from this dunya after Allah presents it all to them? Subhanallah. See how difficult the affair is. See, see where the test is for us. Huh? We don't live in a cave, like the people of the cave that we're going to speak about. We live exposed to the dunya, uh, exposed, to the, exposed to the glamour of the dunya, to the sweetness of the dunya, to the greenery of the dunya, to the attractive nature of the dunya. We're exposed to all of this. But when you're exposed to all of this dunya, that's when the test starts. Will you fall in love with it or will you fall in love with the revelation? Will you fall in love with the revelation and the Qur'an or will you fall in love with this dunya that's all so attractive? And those who fall in love with the dunya, they lost space for revelation from their hearts. And those who fall in love with the revelation, then they would recite at night and in the day and they would recite in their graves even after dying. Radiallahu anhum. Uh, and we know the story of that companion who could be heard, it could be heard from his grave that he was reciting Tabarak al biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadeer. And then Allah said, so Allah said that we decorated this dunya, the earth with its glamour and its beauty and so on, so that we may test people which of them are the best in action. And then he said, وَإِنَّا لَجَاعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا صَعِيدًا جُرُوزًا Allah said, and you, know, see, you see all this beauty and all this glamour? One day, they will wake up and we would have finished all of it. It will all come to an end. Huh? We will destroy all of it and all of it will finish. Indicating what? That those who become attracted by the dunya and fall in love with it, they should know that what they are falling in love with huh, will disappear. It will totally disappear before their eyes. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moved over to speaking about the story of the people of the kahf, the people of the cave. And He said, Allah, Allah Azza He said, أَمْ حَسِبْتَ أَنَّ أَصْحَابَ الْكَهْفِ وَالرَّقِيمِ كَانُوا مِنْ آيَاتِنَا عَجَبًا Before we go into the story of the people of the Kahf, uh, the people of Makkah, after the Prophet ﷺ announced his prophecy and so on, the people of Makkah, they thought, you know what, let's go and ask the Yahud, the Jewish community in Medina. Remember, there were, uh, there were idol worshippers in Makkah, but there weren't any Jews. The Jews lived in Medina al Munawwara. He said, let's go and speak to the Jewish community in Medina. Uh, they had revelation, they had prophets, uh, they had the book. Perhaps they will be able to tell us about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perhaps they will be able to tell us about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whether indeed he is a true prophet or not. So uh, two of the people of Makkah went to Medina al Munawwara and they said to the Jewish people, they said, look, there's a young man from amongst us and he is... Uh, saying that he's the last and final prophet 
and you guys have the book and you had a prophet and you people read the book and you're worshippers of one God and so on. Tell us, what do you think? Uh, what do you think? Is he a prophet or isn't he? They said, they said, uh, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. They said, go back and ask him three questions. Go back and ask him three questions. If he replies to those three questions, then indeed he is the last and final prophet. And if he can't reply these three questions, then he's not the prophet and do whatever you want with him. Do whatever you want with him. So they came back and they had these three questions and they were all pumped up and uh, excited that we're going to catch him out today. So they went to the Prophet ﷺ and they said to him three questions. Number one, tell us about those people who went into a cave and they slept for so long and they disappeared from their community. Number two, tell us about the man who traveled the earth from the east to the west and he saw so many lands and so many places. And number three, tell us about the soul. What can you tell us about the soul? Three questions. They came and asked the Prophet ﷺ these three questions and the Prophet ﷺ said to them, I'll tell you tomorrow. He said, I'll tell you tomorrow. But Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say insha'Allah. He didn't say insha'Allah. Now remember, just to note out here, that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would miss out things, that if we normally, if we miss them out, it seems like a defect. If the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam missed out something, and that particular thing, if we miss it out, it seems like a defect. Don't ever think that that is a defect for the Prophet ﷺ. That is the pinnacle of perfection for him ﷺ. What does that mean? For example, the Prophet ﷺ was praying a four raka'ah prayer one day, and at the end of two raka'ahs he gave salam. And the Sahaba from behind said, Anasita ya Rasulullah am qasurat is salah. How, did you forget or, did, or has the prayer been shortened, Messenger of Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said, I forgot. Then he stood up and he completed his prayer. Now, for us to forget, that's a defect. But for the Prophet ﷺ to forget here, it was not a defect. We'll explain how. Give another example. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ was returning from a battle and they slept on the way back to Medina and everybody missed Fajr. The Prophet ﷺ and everybody else missed Fajr. They woke up when, when, the, when the rays of the sun was hitting them hard because of the sun, heat of the sun. They woke up in the morning and then they moved and then they prayed their Fajr. The Prophet ﷺ missed Fajr. For us, this is a defect. For the Prophet ﷺ, it was not a defect. The Prophet ﷺ in this case did not say, Insha'Allah. If we don't say that, that's a defect for us. Right? We should say, Insha'Allah. For the Prophet ﷺ, nothing was a defect. This is what we have to understand. Why? For a beautiful hadith that Imam Malik radiallahu anh narrates in his Muatta, literally two words, this hadith. Uh, and everyone should memorize this. The Prophet ﷺ said, Unsa li usan. Unsa li usan. Unsa means, I am made to forget. What does it mean? I am made to forget. And usan means, I am made to forget so that I create a sunnah. So that I create a sunnah. So when the Prophet ﷺ was made to forget that he is praying a four raka'ah prayer and he stopped at the end of two, why was he made to do that? So that when we forget, we know how to complete our prayers. Why was the Prophet ﷺ made to miss fajr? So that when we miss fajr, we know what to do when we wake up. It's not the end of the world, pray your fajr. Is that clear? And so on. So these men, when they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they uh, presented the three questions, the Prophet ﷺ said, I'll tell you tomorrow. And he ﷺ didn't say, Insha'Allah. Uh, and then he was expecting revelation. But revelation didn't come. And it didn't come. And it didn't, they, they came back and they came back and they came back. And it didn't come and didn't come and didn't come. And then, later on, revelation came. Jibreel ﷺ came. And the Prophet ﷺ, later on in the surah, he was informed that if you say that I will do something tomorrow, then you should say, Insha'Allah, God willing. Is that clear? And then the Prophet ﷺ answered all three questions. The question of the people of the Kahf, the question of the one who roamed the earth, Zul Qarnayn, and the question of the soul. All three questions were answered. Uh, so what the Jews told them from Medina, 
the Prophet ﷺ fulfilled all three questions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Am hasibta anna ashab al-kahfi wal-raqeemi kanu min ayatina ajaba. Remember these people, they came to ask about something really amazing, something wow, out of this world. Uh, let's see if we can answer this about the people of the cave. What did Allah say? Did you assume that the story of the people of the cave were raqeem and what's a raqeem? Kahf is the cave, a raqeem, the scholars have differed. Um, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas said nobody knows what ar raqim is. It's one of the things that Allah uh, concealed its knowledge. Other scholars said it was a, uh, uh, it was a piece of uh, metal upon which the names of the people of the cave were written. Is that clear? Uh, so Allah said, did you assume that the people of the cave and the plank upon which their names were written min ayatina ajaba, was something really amazing from our signs? What's Allah saying here? Did you assume that that's something amazing from our signs? It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, that's not as amazing as other signs that we have given you. There are other signs that are even more amazing than those of the people of the cave. These people who have come to question you, and they think, and they think that uh, the story of the people of the cave is something amazing, then inform them that indeed this story of the people of the cave is from our signs. But they are, we have signs which are even more greater than the people of the cave. For example, the Prophet ﷺ knowing the future and knowing things that will occur before the day of judgment, all of these affairs were even greater than the story of the people of the cave. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِذْ أَوَلْ الْفِتْيَةُ إِلَى الْكَهْفِ Remind yourself of the time when al-fitya, fata in Arabic means young man, fitya is its plural. Allah said, remind yourself of the time when these young men took shelter. Awa ya is to take shelter. Uh, when they took shelter, when these young men took shelter in the cave. And when they took shelter in the cave, what did they say? They said, Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmatan. They made a dua and they said, O oh Lord, give us from yourself mercy, rahma, and prepare for us in our affair, rashad. And what's rashad? Correctness and guidance. Correctness and guidance. Give us correctness and guidance in this affair of ours. Allah said, when they made a dua, Allah replied to the dua. They made a dua, which was, O oh Allah, uh, grant us from yourself mercy and prepare for us in our matter guidance. Allah replied to this. Do you know how Allah replied? In the next verse, Allah replied and He said, Fadarabna. You know this fa? This fa is known as the answering fa. What is it? The answering fa. Another example of this is in Surah Al Anbiya. When Yunus alayhi salam, what did he say? Yunus alayhi salam said, وَذَنُّونِ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَلَّا نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ When Yunus alayhi salam, in the, in the darkness of the night, he stood up and he prayed to Allah and he said, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ There is no deity except you. There is no one worthy of worship except you, Subhanak. You are glorified. إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Indeed, I am from the oppressors. What was the next verse? Allah said, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ He made that dua and then Allah said, Fa. When he made that dua, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ We answered his dua, وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ And we took him out of uh, anxiety and out of this difficulty. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And like that, we saved the believing people also from anxiety and trouble and difficulty. Likewise here, when the people, when these young men made the dua and said, "Rabbana, Rabbana, atina min ladunka rahmatan, wa hiyil lana min amrina rashada," what did Allah say? "Fadarabna." Allah said they made the dua and Allah said, "Fadarabna ala azanihim." We gave them uh, mercy from ourselves that we placed. "Fadarabna ala azanihim." We struck their ears in the cave. Sinin adada for many years, for plenty of years, we struck their ears. I.e. 
we, um, we, we closed off their ears such that they were not able to hear anything. Such that they were not able to hear anything. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala close up their ears and not their eyes? Their eyes kept open. They were asleep with their eyes open, but they couldn't hear anything. Why is that? Because, uh, you know when you have to wake up in the morning? And, and mashallah, everyone's got experience of that now, haven't they? When you have to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning for sahri, uh, and somebody calls you, right? You hear the call before you see. Uh, what disturbs a person sleeping is noise more than seeing. Is that clear, right? So people complain uh, about noise that they can't go get to sleep. They don't complain about a sight. Because if it's a sight, then cuddle away in your duvet, under your duvet, you won't see. But you might still be under your duvet and the, the music from your neighbor's house is so loud, it's disturbing your sleep. So you hear, uh, 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 so what you hear disturbs a person's sleep. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covered up their hearing such that they weren't able to hear anything and they were asleep. Is that clear? And then Allah said, ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ لِنَعْلَمَ أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَى لِمَا لَبِثُوا أَمَدًا And then we uh, revived them and brought them up again so that we can make clear أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَى لِمَا لَبِثُوا أَمَدًا Which of the parties was more correct in realizing how long they slept for? Because later on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the one of them, when they woke up قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ كَمْ لَبِثْتُمْ They said to each other, how long have you been asleep? How long have you been here? Uh, one said, uh, We've been here for a day or some portion of a day. And the other one said, Your Lord knows better how long you slept for. Your Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, knows better how long you slept for. Now the scholars have said, This cave, where is it? There's a dispute. Some said, As far as Spain. Some said as far as Spain, others said in Turkey, others said in Jordan, uh, I went to one in Syria, so there's lots of these caves, right? But nobody can actually pinpoint the exact cave of the people of the Kahf, right? So that's clear. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He spoke about a group of young men who went to this cave. Why did they go to this cave? They were, they were fleeing from their people because their people were disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know these young men who went to the cave they weren't normal young men they were princes each and every one of them was a prince right and they came from very high notable families and they went into this cave to save their iman they went into this cave to protect and safeguard their faith and their iman and this is extremely important for all of us in the times that we're living in. That when our iman is in danger, then we must find a cave for it. Subhanallah. And you know the cave for our iman? What is it? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِنَّ الْإِيمَانَ لَيَزْرَأُ إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ كَمَا تَزْرَأُ الْحَيَّةُ إِلَى حُفْرِهَا The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Iman takes rescue in Madinatul Munawwara and refuge the way the snake takes refuge in the hole in the earth. Uh, so our refuge, the refuge of our Iman is in Madinatul Munawwara. Sallallahu ala sahibiha wa sallam wa barak. Naam. So these young men, they were fleeing from their people. Why? Because their people were disbelieving in God. And not only disbelieving in God, they were, uh, they, they were punishing those who would not follow their ways. Those who denied their way and believed in one God and worshipped one God, they would punish them. So these young men, they decided on fleeing uh, and, and uh, taking refuge in this cave. And when they reached the cave, they prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify their affairs and show them guidance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, put them asleep for, for, for a long time. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and now from these verses, what do we learn from these verses? That it's from the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those people who isolate themselves from difficulties, from tribulations, from hardships in their religion, isolate themselves and turn away to the cave of protection in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
in the Quran al Karim, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of them the way He took care of the people who went into the cave. Who went into the cave. Now, so people who are in difficulty in their religion, uh, they have to isolate their hearts. And all of us are in difficulty. Why? Because our hearts are exposed to the glamour of the dunya in every moment, in every second. Our hearts and our eyes are exposed to, to, to the attractive nature of this dunya. You know, once I was, um, I, I, I was with a friend and I was going to a lesson in, in, uh, in Al-Muraq, in the Insan Al-Kamil lesson. And I said to this young man, I said, uh, so what do you do? He said, I'm a computer technician. Uh, I work in programming. I said, what is it exactly that you do? What is it exactly that you do? He said, basically, I, uh, our company has contracts with uh, big companies that have uh, websites that are, uh, uh, that, that, that are um, browsed the most, right? So uh, our um, programming company has contracts with these companies. So I said, what do you actually do? He said, now their websites that are clicked on, their websites that are clicked on the most in the day, they need extra protection and they need extra guarding from being infiltrated, from being uh, hacked and so on. So what we do is we create programs for those big companies to protect their web websites. And I just went silent. I said, Subhanallah, our hearts are beating every second. Our hearts are beating every second. And our heart is exposed to the biggest thief, the shaitan, in every moment. And our hearts are exposed to all of the dunya that we see with our eyes, hear with our ears, touch with our hands, taste with our mouths, walk to with our feet, huh? sense. Our, our hearts are exposed. Our outer body, all of our limbs are channels that go into the heart. And the heart is beating in the remembrance of Allah. But you know when uh, disturbances from these channels come into the heart, the heart forgets the remembrance of Allah. So what does the believing person's heart need? It needs uh, a high-tech uh, program that protects its heart from being infiltrated and hacked by the shaitan and the dunya. From being infiltrated and hacked by the shaitan and the dunya. Is that clear? No. So our hearts are now being hacked. They are on the watch all the time. They are on the watch and being hacked in every single moment of our lives. So what do we need to do? We need to create a cave around our hearts. We need to create a cave of protection around our hearts so that the shaitan can't reach into our hearts, so that the glamour of the dunya can't reach into our hearts, so that the distractions and the attractions of the world cannot take away the sweetness of Iman from our hearts. And then we need to make dua and say, the way these young men made dua, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِن لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا Oh Allah, give us mercy and give us guidance in our affairs. Imam Muhammad ibn Ishaq, rahmatullahi Ali, speaks about the story of the people of the cave and he says, uh, there's a difference of opinion, but let's go with his story. He says that the people of Isa alayhi salam, who were given the Injil, uh, they began to rebel against their scripture and rebel against their religion and rebel against worshipping one God. And they started to worship idols and they started to sacrifice animals in the names of these idols. And the uh, sins prevailed in their societies and in their communities. Uh, until one of their leaders, he transgressed against the religion so much that anybody who was clinging onto the religion, he would punish them to such an extent that he would kill them. And he would go around uh, propagating his transgression against the religion and the worshipping of idols and uh, mischief and sins and so on. When he reached these young men and they were princes, they were children of, of the kings. He said to them, look, come my way. And they said, no, we don't want to go your way. He said, either you come my way or it's death for you. Uh, 
they said to him, Inna lana ilahan mala as samawati wal arda azamatum wa jabaruta. They said to him, You know, our Lord, He is the one who the heavens and the earth has been filled with His might. The heavens and the earth has been filled with His might. We will not call upon anybody other than Him. And we will never ever accept what you are calling us towards. You can do whatever you want to us, we won't leave our religion. فَأَمَرَ بِنَزْعِ مَا عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ الثِّيَابِ الْفَاخِرَةِ وَأَخْرَجَهُمْ مِنْ عِنْدِهِ So what did he do? He, he took from them these princes, they were dressed in the most expensive of clothes. He, he took from them those expensive clothes. This is one narration. Another narration is that he, uh, uh, he threatened them with death. So they said to him, look, we've got some affairs to deal with. Let us deal with our affairs and we'll be back. And they left out from him and they left from the city and they went to seek this cave. And there they went into the cave and they turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. There in the cave they stood and they worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They cried to him, they, they, they placed, uh, they, 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 they worshipped him and they called to him and they cried to him. Why? Because of the transgression of their people. Uh, they were asking Tawbah forgiveness and repentance for themselves and for these people who are transgressing against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they would stay in the cave day and night worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then they would send one of their people out into the local city who would bring them back food and who would hear what's happening uh, of, or, of the affairs of that city or, or, or the news. And as they were on their way to the cave, there was a local dog, and what did he do? He started walking behind them. The local dog, he started walking behind them, and he went, and he sat outside the cave, and he stayed with them. And he became so fortunate that Allah mentioned him in the Qur'an. He became so fortunate that saying his, saying his name in the Qur'an is a mean of reward for all of us. He became so fortunate that he will be with them in the gardens of paradise. The scholars have said, uh, if this was a dog, that walked behind the people of the cave and he became so honored that his name is mentioned in the Quran <coughs> became so honored that he'd be from the people of the garden of paradise just by walking with these people the scholars have said then what do you think about those who follow Sayyiduna Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how Allah will honor them Allah, how Allah will give them an admission into the gardens of paradise with Sayyiduna Muhammad so long as they follow behind him huh? So long as they follow behind him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you know they say that you know the dog has a, a quality of loyalty. The dog has a quality of loyalty such uh, that the dog will stay outside the house of the master, naked and hungry, but won't leave that door. He'll stay outside hmm, the door of his master, naked and hungry, and will never leave the door of his master. This dog, he followed the people of the Kahf and he became successful. If we follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with loyalty, regardless of what happens, khalas, it's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's it. He is the role model. We become fixated upon him, then we should think that Allah will give us much more and much greater than what he gave this dog. Why? Because this dog only followed in the footsteps of of the people of the Kahf and he, he sat outside their cave. The people who attached themselves to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala shows them uh, beautiful things. Mm. Sayyidina Anas radiallahu an said, one day I was walking out, out of the masjid with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and at the door there was a man and he said, Messenger of Allah, when is the day of judgment? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, وَمَاذَا عَادَتَ لَهَا Why have you prepared for the day of judgment? And the man said, Messenger of Allah, I don't have too many prayers and I don't have too many fasts. But all that I can tell you is I love you and I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Sayyidina Anas said, the Prophet sallallahu said to him, Al mar'u ma'aman ahab. Then know that every individual shall be with those whom he loves. And this, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, that was the most happiest day in our lives when the Prophet sallallahu told us that we will be with those whom we love. And we love the Prophet sallallahu And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum whom they truly loved him and they set the threshold of love. 
They set the threshold of love. And you know it's so high that if we raise our heads to look towards it, we will break our necks. Uh, they indeed loved the Prophet ﷺ a true love. They gave up everything for him. Everything just for obedience for him. In f following his footsteps, following his ways, imitating him, reflecting him, giving up their lives for him ﷺ. But even more so, living the way he lived ﷺ. Sometimes it's easy to give up life, but it's hard. Uh, it's harder to live life the way somebody else did. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, every one of them, they imitated and reflected the Prophet sallallahu That's why they can say, they have got all right to say we love the Prophet sallallahu But when we make this statement, we should think twice. Does this statement actually reflect our states? Allah make it reflect our states. Say, Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen wa Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. ويا ذا القوة المتين الحمد لله رب العالمين نعم الله إن شاء الله we'll stop there and we'll continue tomorrow uh, with the story of the people of the cave